<clears throat> well, no better time than now to tell you. I want to just to let you know that I'm, I'm going to call in sick today. And for the next five Sundays, I think it's time you take a break from hearing from me and learn from another person who's also been called by God to teach. As is appropriate to do so when you have a guest preacher, for those who maybe do not know them, to commend them, to introduce them, I want to introduce today's preacher to you. Some of you have read some of his books. Others of you have maybe just heard his name, for he is pretty well known. Our guest teacher, for the next six weeks that we're going to have, was not born in America, thinking of the countries. He came from an important family. It's nice to be from that kind of family. And at an early age, his father passed away. As you can imagine, no doubt a hardship on him. As a result of his father's passing, he had to take over the family business, and it was quite a responsibility. But God's kindness to him, he grew to be very rich and has been involved in very important construction projects. Due to his insight, leaders from around the world have actually sought out his counsel. For a time, being instructed by his dad, he did have, a, for a season of life, a good relationship with the Lord. But later, embarrassingly, he ran away from God, who blessed him, and instead lived his own life, pursuing his own desires for much of his life. But this morning, he's come back. He has a testimony he wants to share with us, some instruction he wants to offer. People know him by many names. He does indeed have many nicknames, as some of you do. But the one he refers to himself today as is the preacher. The preacher. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes, I'd like to introduce you to today's preacher, Solomon. For Solomon is for the next six weeks going to teach us from his life, from his writings, inspired by the hand of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, given to the people of God today that we might learn these lessons recorded millennia ago. If you're wondering where Ecclesiastes is, the best place for me to tell you is to find a way to the very middle of the Bible, Psalms, and then turn to the right. The first book of the Bible you'll come to after Psalms is Proverbs. The next book after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. As you're finding your way to Ecclesiastes, for those of you who do not have a copy of the Bible but would love to have one, we'd love for you to have one. Those are available for free in a readable translation. If you would, after we're done this morning, as you make your way out just to the right at the Welcome Center, we have Bibles. Just say, hey, I heard you guys have free Bibles. Can I get one of those? would love for you to have one. If you don't have one, just feel free to just sort of follow along with somebody else here or just listen, and I'll read the text to you this morning. Ecclesiastes... We're being introduced in Ecclesiastes throughout the entire book over seven times to this man, the preacher, whom I believe is Solomon, based on the description there given in verse 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. He is a man indeed endowed by God with inordinate amount of wisdom. Second Chronicles chapter 1 tells us the story of how this came to pass how he came to be known as the wisest man who has ever lived on the planet except Jesus himself. Because back in 2 Chronicles, after his son, after, excuse me, after his father David died, and he was made king at a young age, God told him he would give him anything that he asked for now that he's king. And the one thing he asked for was wisdom. Because he knew at a young age he would not know how to lead God's people. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 11 and 12 records the following. God replied to this request and said, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, 
or the life of those who hate you and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I made you king, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you and none after you shall have the like. So here is a young man at a young age given everything you could possibly imagine and more. And for a season of time, he uses what God had given him to honor the Lord. But eventually in time, he rebelled against the Lord. He did not use that divine wisdom to honor the Lord, to lead people to the Lord. Instead, he lived his life in the wildest ways you can imagine. He traveled through the hallways and the highways and byways of life. Anything you can imagine, anything you can consider, anything your heart would want to do, anything you had to wish you had the money to finance, he did. And he's come back to tell us about it. You could almost say Solomon is the ultimate prodigal son who took his inheritance and pursued all that the world had apart from God. That he tasted, saw all that there was to see. That he knew things that you would never know your entire life. He knew. And in the latter years of his life, he comes back and he gives this record, this accounting. Like a person who has returned from a journey from a faraway land who has tales to tell, so does Solomon share with us what he has learned. Now, let me offer you a warning. Like a captain who comes on the overhead speakers who warns you we are about to experience some turbulence, I want to warn you because we are about to experience some turbulence for the next six weeks. The preacher takes us down some roads that many of us have wanted to go down but never have. And he, in detail, is going to tell us things that some of us aren't going to like to hear. He's going to show us where these roads lead. Some of us are going to squirm in discomfort because you're already heading down that road and you didn't realize it ended the way it described here in the Word. Others, you're going to have your desires exposed as all of us learn that the future results in the decisions you make today. So for those of you taking notes this morning, the preacher is going to give us three lessons about life in which he builds on for the next five weeks to follow. Three lessons about life. First of all, he tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he tells us the problem with life. The problem with life. Look at it with me. He says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? In the very beginning, he declares a message that he carries through until the very end. In fact, these verses serve as bookends. Bookends at which you could see, indeed, what it is to be understood here. For he indeed declares at the very end in chapter 12 about vanities, as he says in verse 8. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And what he does is he gives away the end before he gets into the detail. And I want us to see immediately that this, this theme is thrust upon us in this book, what it is that he's talking about. Because it important, apparently it's very important for him to understand that he communicates because five times in just verse two, he's using this word vanity. Five times he's saying vanity, 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 vanity. He, in a redundant, cascading, compounding way, he declares this vanity. 38 times referring to himself as the preacher throughout this work, he declares all of life is vanity. 38 times in 12 chapters, he says, all life is vanity. 
What is this word he's talking about? What is this term he's using here? Well, obviously, as it needs to be understood, we're, we're reading an English translation of what would have originally been written in Hebrew. A Jewish person himself, a Hebrew himself, writing in the Hebrew, this word that's being translated in English today is this Hebrew word that sometimes is translated breath, vapor, mist, that by lesson is understood to mean vanity, here today, gone tomorrow. You guys know what this is like. It's a cold winter day here in Indianapolis. You step outside the comfort of their heated car or maybe inside that workplace of yours or your home, and you go outside to maybe scrape the ice off the windshield or maybe to go check the mailbox or maybe just to go inside a store, and you breathe. And as you see that warm air just come outside of you, and it just is like this vapor, right? And it just is just breathes, and it's there, and it just fades. It's gone. You breathe again, and there it is. And if you're a kid, you love this. You, like, have asthma attacks. <laughs> just trying to just see this thing go. But for as fast and as hard as you breathe, no matter how much you try to breathe, whether you hold your breath for a little bit and then breathe, or you breathe repeatedly, it's always the same result. Gone. It's gone. And that's exactly what Solomon is talking about here. Life is like a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. It's, it's in a place, and then it's over. It certainly begins to put things in perspective here, as what he's essentially doing is exposing this emptiness by definition of life being by this vanity, he's saying it is meaningless, it is empty, it is futile, it is useless. He's saying life lacks any true substance or content. It's just but a vapor. You say, well, that's, that's not my best life now. What are you talking about? Well, if you look at verse 3, he tells us the perspective that represents this belief. He says, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? This phrase, under the sun, is a, is a euphemism. It's just a, what he's essentially beginning to give here is an expose on secularism. This is the humanist perspective Represented in verse 3, the, the representation of life after Adam under the fall by which we all live today apart from God. If we lived life apart from God, Solomon is saying, hey, I've lived life apart from God. Let me tell you what it's like. It's all vanity. And throughout this work, this teacher goes back and forth from this horizontal perspective to this vertical perspective. And this horizontal perspective is always this phrase, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. You just track with me of the next six weeks. Read it yourself. Read it yourself as next week we're in chapter 1, verse 12, all the way through the end of chapter 2. And just read and find the key words, the key phrases, and you'll see how many times these themes keep popping up. And this phrase, under the sun, is life lived now, apart from God. He's saying when you live life like that, you're born, you live, and you die. You're born, you live, and you die. And then after you die, someone else is born, and they live, and they die, and on and on it goes with no remembrance and no care that you even lived or died. Life has a way of being like the ocean Waves washing up on the shore as your footprints of life were indented there in it, but to only then have over some time all that be wiped away as if you were never there, as if you never existed. C can you feel it? The heaviness, the despair, vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What, is it, what does a man gain by all the toil, all the work, and which he's working under the sun? 
Some of you have maybe seen the movie. came out in the 60s, 1967. Robert Redford starred in it, titled Cool Hand Luke. It's a movie in which he plays a character who at the beginning of the movie is drunk, walking down a small town, cutting the heads off the top of parking meters. So he gets put into jail, sentenced to two years. And over this time of his time there, he, as a, Korea, as a veteran of Korean War, he's a leader and he's a dynamic guy and he's a relational guy and he begins to, they, the guys just like him. They begin to look to him. But he doesn't want to be held down. He wants to break out. He wants to get free. And so he has an attempt to escape. And he escapes, but he's caught and he's brought back. And the attempt to escape, and he escapes, he's, time, he's brought back. Famous line in the movie, spoken by the warden, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And then one of his punishments, when he is there caught again, after being beaten, is he is told to dig a hole in the ground that's measured in the shape of what would be a burial ground, where he'd place a casket, where someone would be buried. And he is to dig out as far down and as far wide and as far long as he's told to. He digs it all out, and then he's told to fill it back up. He fills it back up. It's raining, it's coming down, it's hot. He's by himself, he's totally isolated. He's being beaten. This thing happens day after day after day. Dig it up, bury it. Dig it up, fill it. Dig it up, fill it. Finally, at the end of this scene, he just falls over and cries, please give me mercy. Please give me mercy. This is what Solomon's saying life is like. This is what saying work is like. You work, and you're done for the day. And you got to go back to work, and you're done for the day. And you got to go back to work, you're done for the day. You've got to go back to work, and then you're done for the day. And then you can't work because work has destroyed your body. But then you think about work, and then you die. And someone comes behind you, and you work, and then you've got to go back to work. And you work, and you've got to go back to work. And you work, and you go back to work, and then it's over. So this is what life is like. This is the reality of it, he says. This depression, this great discouragement and despair, collapsing. This is exactly what the preacher is talking about here in verse 3. Does man accomplish anything? The answer is obvious. He says he accomplishes nothing, which takes us to the next lesson. It's not just the problem with life. He says, let me show you the picturization of life. He gives illustrations like all good preachers should. He illustrates his point. He says, let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. And he, he gives five examples here in verses 4 through 8. Read it with me. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, and the, nor the ear with hearing. These verses here, in verses 4 through 7 and 8, are so it's a Hebrew poem, which is describing these five illustrations of vanity. By no means is he giving all the illustrations, for many are still follow in the following chapters, but he gives five illustrations of vanity here. And you notice they all have the same cadence to them. There's an endless coming and going, but nothing reaches the point of completion. I mean, you see this here. A generation comes and a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. He's not talking about a single person. He's talking about an entire generation of people, a global generation will be replaced by another generation, will be replaced by another generation. Only thing that stays the same, only thing that's still here for each of those generations is the earth. 
He describes again in verse 5 this sense of coming and going. The sun rises, the sun goes down. It hastens to the place where it rises. Now what's happening here in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 that's significant even for us today, he is making scientific statements under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that were not proven true for thousands of years later. Let me give you an example. Verse 6. He says, The wind blows to the south, and it goes around to the north. And around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. For a lot of time, people just thought, well, that's just from sort of Hebrew poetry that it's always windy out. But he's actually making a statement that's remarkable of an understanding of global, global circum, circum, I'm getting the score word wrong here. Circulation. I was such a difficult word. <laughs> I was looking at a different word. Global circulation of the atmosphere. There are definite global circuits of the winds of the world. This is now a fact known by meteorologists, but it was not known until just recently. Because it was only until recently that they had the upper air sounding and measuring instruments in which these things could be tracked. So just, just as a side note, Solomon, under the inspiration of God himself, is making a statement about the wind patterns of the globe that people had no way of knowing and sort of writing off, I guess he's just sort of poetically saying it's just always windy. It never stops being windy. Somewhere it's always windy. He's actually describing how true it is that there are these, these circulations of wind that's happening, these global circuits. The same is true in verse 7. It's hydrologic cycle, this water cycle being driven by this atmospheric circulation. Look at what he says here. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they will flow again. Did you know it was not until the 20th century that it was believed, even by scientists, that rain on lands came as a result of evaporation from local lakes and rivers? Solomon says thousands of years ago, it was not even known, scientifically proven to be true until the 20th century, which was the reality as we see here in the text, that the sun evaporates water from the ocean, carried inland by the winds, where it condenses and falls to the earth, returns to the ocean where it comes back out, just as verse 7 says. And Solomon is saying, it's the same cycle, over and over and over. He does the same thing in verse 8, makes this profound statement, all things are full of weariness. This weariness is this, this word here for work, labor. A man cannot utter it. This idea here in verse 8 is the reality of what he's stating. Is this, again, a profound scientific truth never known until recent modern times. And here's essentially the idea. The idea is this. There is no such thing as any energy, any mass, any matter that has been created or annihilated since it was first created. that is now the most basic and best proved law of science, that there is nothing new under the sun. That that there's this totality of mass and energy, and it remains unchanged in its existence. He says in verse 8, A man cannot utter it, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, it's never enough, nor the ear filled with hearing. Five illustrations by which he's just sort of unpacking the reality. He's like, hey, vanity of vanities. He says, you don't have to take my word for it. Just take a walk. Just take a walk. Just look. Just look up in the sky. Just look at people. Just look at the wind. He says, everywhere you go, it tells this lesson. This picturization of life, this futility of it, which takes us to the third lesson that we're taught this morning. The first being the problem with life, the second being the picturization of life, now the principles to measure life, verses 9, 10, and 11. He says, what has been, excuse me, what has been is what will be. 
what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things, yet to be among those who come after. What he has done in verses 9, 10, and 11 is answer the question of verse 3. And what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? He answers it in verse 9. The, the statement here is, what has been, what will be, what has been done, what will be done, there is nothing new under the sun. This phrase, under the sun, is an interesting phrase. From Assyrian royal inscriptions, it appears that the kings during this time were always seeking out accomplishments, not uncommon to today's presidencies in our own country. Accomplishments that they could boast that they had something that they did, they had something that they accomplished that had never been accomplished before. You see this today. A bill being passed. An act being issued. A, a, a point of development within the country. Well, this is exactly what the Assyrian royal inscriptions were thinking, and this is common for what Solomon's time is. The king would want to, having done something never been done before, would then want to include himself as a creator, as a founder. As, in other words, as someone who had done something never been done that there was never been a precedent for. So what would this look like? A military conquest, a building project, such as a road, a palace, a temple, or a city, an introduction of a new technique or a new celebration, a new holiday. Solomon says in verse 9, look, there's nothing new. You say, but we've not had this holiday. He says, yeah, but you've had a holiday. Yeah, but you've not, we've not had this road here. Yeah, but you've had roads. But you've not seen the glory of this city. Uh, but you've not seen the glory of this other city. 2,000 years before your time. Oh, but you don't know the marvels of our technology today and how we can proliferate information so amazingly through social networks. People have been communicating a lot of information for thousands of years before you. How you do it in its detail is not the important. It's not the part. He says here, indeed, there is nothing new under the sun. I mean, this is this is a part of which you just sort of feel like, um, Eric. I was sort of hoping for a little bit of a positive message. Had kind of a rough week. It's the holiday weekend. Got some friends coming over. Wouldn't mind a little bit of cheer. This is what you have to offer. I should have slept in. I mean, I had a choice of travel this weekend. I, I came. I'm committed to local church. This is what you provide. Before I answer, let's keep reading. He says again in verse 10, is there, a, is there a thing which it is said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before. And here's the key. Verse 11, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be, of, of, nor will there be any remembrance of light, later things yet to be among those who come after Solomon is saying, not just our accomplishments, but even our very personhood. Even our very memory. Let me test this. Just by consideration. For those of you who have been to funerals. For those of you who have been to maybe five funerals, ten funerals. When you go to a funeral, it's right after that time that person has died. The memories are fresh. They're all brought back to mind. And everyone is there thinking about it. And they're all thinking about that person. As you thought about that person. But now that person has passed away and it's been a year, it's been two years, it's been five years, it's been ten years, it's been twenty years. Of all those funerals you've been to, I'm not talking maybe the spouse, Maybe the child. Just talking by and large, the funerals in general, of all those people. How often have you thought about them? How often have others thought about them? How often has, has, have we talked about the famous people? Has anybody been talking about Michael Jackson in today's news recently, this week? When he died, you thought our country was going to end. We could not imagine the king of pop, life without the king of pop. 
Has anybody talked about it recently? Whitney Houston has recently died. She seems like yesterday's story. So whether it be your friend, maybe even a relative, or somebody who's a cultural icon, you see from your own understanding what he's saying here in verse 11. People coming and going. And like life being this ocean that wipes those memories away, in the end, they're never really remembered. I mean, do you think that anybody danced back in 1000 AD? Do you think anybody danced? Or do you think Michael Jackson introduced dancing? It wasn't until he came that we somehow knew how to dance. And let's face it, that boy could dance. My point is this. We don't remember anybody from 1000 AD and their fill-in-the-blank skill. Not only think of church history. I mean, think about like people like Martin Luther and John Calvin. Are we only saying that they're like two Christians who ever like love God and his word? Or is it not millions and millions and millions and millions of people? Do you know any of them by name? With the exception of maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Is Solomon is doing here in the text what is a really uncomfortable exercise for all of us. He's asking us to answer some questions that we do not like having to answer. Questions like, when my life is over, how will it have mattered? Questions like, while I'm living today, what am I living for? Stating that a different way, what is my motive? What do I think I'm accomplishing? And friends, these kind of questions are just like punching at the foundation of our life to find out, are you standing on anything of any substance? Or are you just trying to live and eat, make some money, get married, have some kids, have some retirement years and die and be forgotten? Is that really all there is? Because by the cadence of life, by the circles of wind structures, by the repetition of water and evaporation. That appears to be to the secularist, humanist mind all there is. And if today you, my friend, subscribe to the evolutionary principles of origins of life, friend, I'm saying that's what you're left with. For these objects in and of themselves have no meaning. Find me meaning in water. Find me meaning in your spouse. They're just chemical elements put together. Particles, hydrogen, and all these other molecular matters. Where is the meaning? You see Solomon's point? If your life is centered on this world and your motives are coming from this life, then you are seeing that you live a wasted life. That's why this book, though argued by many as being sort of one of the hardest books to preach, is sort of the most applicable book to today's modern society. It's always modern because people are always living in the modern reality of whatever time period it is. This is the time. It's always been the time. This is the day. It's always been the day. Nothing like today. No, well, it'll be tomorrow. Like, who are you? Oh, I'm just a teller of truth. Solomon's saying, I'm just telling you what is true. So the question then is, how do we come to a passage like this and find any hope? Well, there seems to be none. My friend, find what's missing in the text that would otherwise provide meaning if it was found there, that is found in the theme of overall biblical revelation. Because this text itself seems so contrary to the scriptures. It seems so contrary to what we read in other sections of scripture. And in one sense, it is contrary when it's divorced from God, but God is actually the one giving it to us. So ultimately, it's never divorced from him. But God is showing us life apart from him. You know the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And friend, if that is your life now, lived apart from God, that's your life. Eat. <laughs> By all means, eat. I give you some recommendations. Drink, 
be merry, dance, laugh, love, do all that you want to do. Tomorrow you're going to die and be forgotten and not be, have any effect on this world. Your life lived apart from God. But the God who created life said there is another way. There is another way in which you can indeed find hope or another answer can be given to these questions or something greater, something divine in its relationship can be understood. And that's where we see Jesus teach us. That's why his words are so significant. Look at them yourself, if you would, in John chapter 10. Jesus comes to provide the answer to otherwise the futile questions that have been asked long before his time and have never been answered until his time. Who made us? Why do we live? For what do we live? What will it matter how we live? Jesus answers all these questions. He says himself in John chapter 10 as he's talking to the people there, He's talking about how it is indeed. He says in verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. He's giving these imagery of this first century Palestine culture of this shepherding environment of what it means. He says, this is how you come into my fold. This is how you become one of my followers. I am the good shepherd, verse 11, and again in verse 14. But back earlier in verse 10, he says at the end, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Solomon says life apart from God is futile. Jesus says life lived with him is abundant. Is abundant. You can turn one more chapter over, John chapter 11. The story of Lazarus. Martha is expressing her desire, her, her understanding of a resurrection, believing it to be future. But Jesus says in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her, what I ask you, do you believe this? See, friends, that's, that's the tension of Ecclesiastes. That's where we're about to walk for the next six weeks. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that life is indeed just here by happenstance, that we're just an evolutionary byproduct of chance, that we're just here sort of in some sense without any sort of authority over us. It's a secular world. We make up our own laws depending on the mass of people and the communities and the cultural norms that determines how we gather, how we think, how we legalize ourselves. Or do you think we are here, put here by somebody else? That somebody else is in charge because whoever creates gets to own. Whoever owns has authority. Whoever's authority determines the parameters and guides of life. And if we live according to his given parameters, life is rich, life is full, life is, in his words, abundant. So we're being placed at the crossroads here this morning in Ecclesiastes by the preacher Solomon by telling us life is futile apart from God. And Jesus, the wiser man, who is Wisdom incarnate himself says life is abundant, life is full, life is eternal, life is blessed if you believe in me. How do you believe in me? And many of you know, some of you still do not. You believe in Jesus by not believing as a historical figure, though that's true. You believe in Jesus by realizing he is a divine figure as well as a historical figure. That he is God himself who's come in human form. That he might become one of us so that he might fulfill all of God's word for us. That then 
would give himself as a substitute for us, having been crucified on the cross, resurrected from the grave after having been physically buried and dead for three days, resurrected and come back to life. As he said before he then ascended, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. So friends, futile life, abundant life. Meaningless life, rich life with a great future. Whereas he says here, you shall never truly die. That's a choice for you to make. That's a choice some of you have already made in Christ, but you have forgotten. You have forgotten how abundant that life is because you're starting to find your hope, at least try to, find your satisfaction in your work. Friend, when you do that, dear Christian brother or sister, when you try to find your satisfaction in your work, in your marriage, in your children, they make sorry gods because they come and they go. They live and they die. They begin and they end. God is saying those things are temporal. Christian, return back to Christ. Find our hope in Him, our joy in Him. Find our love for Him, our confidence in Him, realizing our eternity in Him, and then we can then see these things as gifts from Him to honor Him. So we work the same jobs. We have the same marriages. We raise the same kids. We live in the same apartments. We live in the same world. We have the same roommates. We share the same language and people groups and ethnicities. But we engage in them differently because of the eternal realities of the hope found in Christ, the abundant, loving Savior. And now begins a journey in Ecclesiastes. Pray with me. <clears throat> God, we thank you for this honest expose of life. It speaks to all of us this morning. All of us, as we consider what it is we're living for. God, I pray that you would show all of us, Christian and non-Christian, the futility of life lived apart from you. Lord, let the work of our hands, the construction projects, the writing projects, the musical endeavors, let them seem less satisfactory than maybe they earlier were. And let us find them to be not what our ultimate hope, joy, and love is found in. God, I pray for all of those who are here today that you've brought here who do not have a relationship with you Father, I pray for them to understand the opportunity that today you offer to them salvation by repenting of their sins and putting their faith in Christ. That you offer them a fruitful life, not a futile one. One of hope and promise and contentment and thankfulness and joy. A promise for tomorrow. I pray that they would, even now as I speak to you, God, turn and believe in Jesus, the only Savior, the only Lord of heaven and earth. You, God, would show yourself today to them to be that one. That others of us would demonstrate the reality of having already believed. Help us now, God, as we take this time to sit and to reflect. Bring to mind, Father, areas that we need encouragement or instruction. Help us, Father, as we reflect now privately, prayerfully before you to think about what you want us to walk away and hold on to this morning. We pray this in your name.